I have another in-depth, detailed and informative build video for you on this Yolio R11 frame set. Building this bike, we had pleasure. We have pain. Let's see how tight the cable ring is on this. And as always, I'll show you the hurdles that we had to jump over in order to build this affordable Chinese carbon bike. I feel excited. Now, every great journey starts with a single step, or in our case, a seat post. First things first, that rubber cover goes over the seat post. It isn't just for show, that should keep water out. Next, we get some carbon grip, it's your best mate. And in this scenario, we lather it up. Now we're gonna be generous with it because the last thing we want is our seat post playing slip and slide. Now, slide that seat post into the frame, secure it with a clamp, grab your trusty Allen key and just do it hand tight. Now a quick glance at the frame and you might think that the torque spec for the seat post was written by an ant, you can hardly see it, but a peek at the manual and it's clear as day, eight Newton meters. So with an extension on our torque wrench, because sometimes that seat post sort of angle plays hard to get, we tighten it up to the recommended eight Newton meters. We can now mount the frame into the stand with the seat post. Moving on to the fork steerer length. Now, this might seem like a jigsaw puzzle at first, but bear with me. The order of the headset bearings and spacers and the whole shebang is all neatly laid out in the manual. It's like following a recipe, but instead of a cake, we're baking a bike. Here is our plan of action. We are using the mandatory 10 mil bearing cover, a 10 mil spacer, followed by another 10 mil spacer. Now the last spacer is our guiding light for the cables which are going through the stem and the bars. That one is required as well as a bearing cover. The 10 mil in the middle, that's just because I want it a bit higher. Next, the crown bearing seat takes its place on the fork, followed by the bearing. It's just a dry fit for now, so hold off on any grease. We'll slide the forks through the frame, and the spacers, and here's where things get a tad tricky. There's a shim inside the stem that felt a bit snug on the steerer tube. So we decided to give it a test run on the steerer by itself. And let me tell you, sliding the bars onto that shim after loosening the stem bolts, it's like trying to fit your jeans on after Christmas dinner, tight. But with a bit of elbow grease and persuasion, we managed to get it on. I say we, I'm there for moral support basically. Friend. <laughs> now each spacer has these little, uh, nipples for want of a better word that connect to the spacer above or below so when you turn the bars it's like a synchronized dance all the spacers move in harmony but our final spacer was being a bit stubborn so johnny with his part-time jeweler skills who knew it filed the nipples down and it all fit together a little bit snugly which is what we needed before marking the steerer tube for cutting we need to ensure that everything is snug there's no sort of slack in the headset or anything can move we need to make sure it's compressed all right so in terms of measuring this up i'm just going to put a flat line here so it'll be flush and then from there i'm going to um, go down about five mil to compensate for the two mil of this expand the plug in there so then once we compress the headset you get enough compression so there's no play in the headset right now. i'll always stick to the golden rule measure twice cut once it's not a hair it won't grow back wrap some tape around the bar to prevent fraying when cutting and when you're placing the cutting guide on the fork make sure you're aligning with the right mark the one you made now i've got this nifty little vice a jewelry vice to be exact with the cutting guide in place we can securely clamp the fork steerer tube into the vice for the cutting you want a fine tooth blade on your hacksaw or a carbide blade i'm using a 32 tpi that's t per inch blade and remember to keep the blade and fork moist with a bit of water Now that we've made our cut, I'm going to take that little bit of excess carbon and place it on my memory shelf. How emotional. And to finish off, give the newly cut edge a good sanding so it's nice and smooth. Oh, and don't forget to remove the tape. All right, after that meticulous cutting, it's time for another test fit. Think of it as trying on the suit after all the alterations. Every build has its quirks, and we noticed that the flange on the top cut bolt is a bit like a hat that doesn't quite sit right. Now because of this, it doesn't sit completely flush with the expander plug, which is crucial to ensure we achieve the proper compression. After tightening the expander plug, it also decided to pay a little trick on us and sort of shifted slightly, so it wasn't properly aligned with the steerer tube. Now I'm not sure if this was this specific expander plug, but I had a spare one, and comparing the two, the spare one seemed like a better choice, more refined and machined in one piece. So 
We opted for that one and a bit of grease on the compression plug bolt, some carbon grip on the outer. With everything in place, we can see that it's all looking good and we know it's going to work. It's now time to undo all that work and dive into the world of cable installation through the bars. I think Johnny hates me for asking him to do all these cable routed bikes. The only logical explanation is that this is a dream. If you haven't seen any of my videos before with bike builds, cable routing is a bit like threading a needle, but on a grander scale. The brake hoses are part of the group set package, and I've got these compressionless Jaguar gear cables, which are pretty damn rigid. It's good to see as well that the olive and the insert were included with the group set. Now a quick note on the Shimano brakes, I've got a full 105 group set here. Now they are set up by default for 140 rotors front and rear, but I'm a fan of bigger rotors, more stopping power, right? Who wouldn't want it? So while the front caliper adapter can be adjusted and swapped around for 160 rotor, the rear caliper needs an additional adapter, a small price to pay for that enhanced performance. Now our test run with the cables through the fork was a success. With that sorted, we mounted the front caliper to the fork. The frame's manual has its suggestion on cable routing through the bars. To cut through all the jargon, cables to the right shifter, here in the UK anyway, should be for the front brake and the rear derailleur. Those heading to the left shifter, they are for the rear brake and the front derailleur. Johnny, with his years of experience, taped the front brake cable to the stem, ensuring that it's gonna exit where we want it to, to go through the bars. A good little tip there. Now for the rear brake, we threaded the cable through the frame from back to front. It enters at the rear and gets a nudge at the bottom bracket and emerges triumphantly at the headset. At this moment in time, I don't have the 160 adapter ready for the rear brake, so we'll just install it to the frame for now. With the brake sorted, it's gear time. After straightening the cable, we're trying to get it as straight as possible, we began with the rear derailleur. Now threading from back to front again, it was all smooth sailing. Now the front derailleur was equally as cooperative, which is nice to see. We also added a blanking grommet to the frame where DI2 wire would typically go. And lastly, we checked the dampening hose that came with the frame to see if it was the right length. Johnny chose a size that will comfortably house our cables, ensuring a rattle-free ride. Right, so now we need to get the headset on. First off, let's give the upper headset bearing seat a good greasing. With that done, it's time to thread the bearing over the cables and settle it into the bearing seat. But we're not done with the grease just yet. The bottom bearing seat and the bearings get the same treatment. Here comes a slightly tricky part. As we slide the forks through the frame, it's crucial to ensure each cable is precisely where it should be, as we mentioned earlier. Get it right now with them sort of spreading out and you will save yourself lots of tinkering time later on. The time has come to route the cables through the bars. Are you ready for some fun? For this task, we're employing a routing tool. Now, this tool is aptly named the risk tool. Looking forward to using the uh, risk cable tool, trying to route these cables. I don't know yet. <laughs> see, how, see how tight the cable routing is on this. Now, once you sort of navigate this through the bars, so this goes through the root of the cable, an adapter is then screwed onto the end of the risk tool. This adapter then connects to the cable housing, acting as a guiding light to pull it through. Our first contender was the front met cable and it slid through the bars without much fuss, but the first cable always is the easiest. Next up, we threaded the root and tool back through the bars to accommodate the brake cable. After attaching the adapter to the root and tool and then to the brake housing, we quickly realized the challenge ahead. Now with the gear cable already in place, space is at a premium where you exit the bars. Now our initial attempt to pull the brake cable through was a no-go, so with a sigh, out came the gear cable. This time we put the brake cable through first. A bit of backtracking, but sometimes that's the name of the game. Now with both of us on the task and using all four hands, we managed to get the gear cable in place. Now a word of advice, if your budget allows, consider getting an electronic group set. It would be a much smoother experience because you would only be putting the brake hoses through the bars and there'd be plenty of room. With the cables in place, it was a moment of triumph. Wow, that's brilliant. <laughs> Now we can fit the stem and this requires a, another dance of adjustments. We need to wiggle the cables, pull them through the bars to take any slack and then rinse repeat basically. It's a process of fine tuning and once satisfied, we tighten the top cap to four newton meters ensuring that everything looks ship shape 
and nothing was rubbing against each other and there was no play in the headset. Now we can look at the shifters and the hoses and we're gonna start with the left shifter. Now we first remove the gear outer, it's a bit easier to set up without it flopping around. After loosening the shifter clamping bolt, we can slide the shifter roughly into position on the bars. We then sized up the brake hose against the shifter. Once we had our measurement, we mark the outer for cutting using a dedicated hose cutting tool ensures a clean cut. Now opening the cable end might require a bit of improvisation now we can install the needle into the end of the cable. It's another task that benefits from the right tool. It makes the installation much easier. Once the needle is in place, the hose is pushed into the shifter. Now pro tip, undo the shifter and move it upwards to give yourself a bit more slack. It's essential to ensure the hose is fully inserted. Tightening the nut on the shifter then creates a seal thanks to the little olive inside, which is crushed. Switching our attention to the right shifter, we roll the hood back and remove the inner cable again. Now with the shifter in place and clamped down, we mark the brake hose for cutting before giving it the snip with the cable cutting tool. Using a small file, we widen the cable end, preparing it for the needle installation. With the needle securely in place, the cable was pushed into the shifter. A bit of adjustment to the shifter gave us that slack we needed. And once Johnny was satisfied, he tightened the nut, ensuring the olive was crushed and a perfect seal was formed between those shifters and brake hose. Lovely job. Let's move on to installing the derailleurs before diving into the gear cables. First things first, ensure the hanger bolts are snugly fit into the frame, so check they're tight. No surprises wanted here. Next, pull any cable slack back through the handlebars, ensuring the cable is just the right length at the derailleur's end. Now back at the shifter, mark the spot for the cable to be cut. A quick snip with the cable cutters and you're all set. As with the breakouters, use a file to expand the hole. Now it's time for a specific cable end to be inserted onto the cable housing. With that in place, thread the inner cable through the shifter and then into the cable housing and viola, everything falls into place. For the rear derailleur, it's just one bolt, the derailleur hanger bolt. First, give it a good greeting. Once that's in place, pull any slack towards the bars in the outer cable, or the hose should we say. At the bottom bracket, ensure there's enough cable as we're routing it over the bottom bracket so we don't want loads flopping down. Back at the shifter, mark the spot for the cable to be cut. After cutting, open up the end, fit the end cap, thread the inner cable through the shifter and the housing. You can push it through and it should emerge nicely out at the back by the derailleur. The final step, tighten the inner cables down using the clamping bolts. Let's shift our focus to the heart of the bike's rotation, the bottom bracket. It's a BB86 bottom bracket in this frame and that's a press fit. Now it's best to tackle the press fit bottom brackets one side at a time. It's like putting on a pair of shoes. You wouldn't try and slip them both on simultaneously. If you can, you're a wizard. Start by greasing the bottom bracket bearing seat. With the bearing press in hand, screw one side in. Repeat the process for the other side. The aim here is to ensure everything is straight and aligned. Now a quick visual check should reveal no gap between the bottom bracket lip and the frame. With the bottom bracket in place, it's time to introduce the crank set. Begin by greasing the crank set and importantly, the spindle. Now with everything prepped, slide the crank set into the frame. Sometimes it might need a little bit of persuasion. Next up, grease the thread lock nut. Now this little component screws into the end of the spindle and you'll need a specific install tool for this. With that in place, it's time to torque up the crank arm bolt. Aim for 13 Newton meters, tighten them both gradually. It ensures an even fit, preventing one from being really tight and the other one lagging behind. How? Physics. <laughs> right, time for some shoes, or wheels should I say the very essence of a bike's mobility. We added the new 105 cassette, the discs are already installed, but before these wheels find their place in the frame, it's essential to grease the through axle. With that done, the wheels can be installed. Now we have the wheels installed, we can adjust the brake calipers. We can start by loosening the caliper mounting bolts, then we pull the brake on and tighten the bolts. This simple action centers the caliper to the disc, which if everything's gone to plan with the wheel install, the disc should already be centered. The same process is then repeated, ensuring that everything aligns perfectly with the disc. We also raided the additional rear caliper mount that we needed off another bike, so the calipers are mounted perfectly. That concludes part one of this build. Check out this video where I cut this exact frame in half. Quite insightful to see what is actually happening. Part two of this video will be up next Sunday and the build should be complete if all goes well.